Hello, I'm Barry Mackay, and today I'm interviewing Peter Williamson, who grew up gay in Queensland, and I'd like to hear your story, please. I'd like to tell it to you, Barry. <laughs> so, growing up gay in Queensland, where did you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Rockhampton, and I lived there for most of 17 years. Um, went to a Christian Brothers all-boys school. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I remember of it. And how long did you stay in Rockhampton? I left there when I was... Uh, the year that I turned 17, I finished high school and I was accepted to go to un the University of Queensland. So I left home then to great relief yes, of all parties, I think. Mm. So when was it that you finally decided to come out? Um, uh, well, I went from my home in Northampton to Brisbane where I kind of met some gay people. I'd never really met openly gay people. And though I knew that I was sexually attracted to other men, I'd never kind of really... I had acted on that, but I hadn't made connections. So this, I made some friends who took me out to a gay nightclub and all of that kind of stuff. This was still when I was 17, so I was illegally drinking. But <laughs> that was, given that homosexuality itself was a crime, that didn't seem to be such, the drinking didn't seem to be such a big thing. So then when I was 18, I, that was the, it was the age of majority. So I thought, well, that will, that's, I'm an adult now. That, this is what my adult life will be. My childhood's finished. So I dyed my hair red and kind of, yes, anybody who didn't know was suddenly aware that I was gay. How did you feel coming out in Queensland at the time in, in, in a rather homophobic society? How did I feel? Um, well, I was very happy. Um, I was quite uh, keen to explore my new identity and my new um, strike out and, you know, um, yeah, see what it was to be a gay man. Um, but I was also aware that it was illegal and that, um, you know, the police had a heavy presence on the street and that they didn't hesitate to um, yeah, exercise their not inconsiderable powers of detaining people. Um, yeah, so there was a little bit of um, anxiety attached to it in that regard. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah. But generally, overall, I was still happy to embrace yes, embrace that identity for myself. Mm. Was it safe to go out on the streets um, dressed like with bright red hair? Did did you feel? Uh, did did people verbally abuse you or? Um, uh, uh, yes, there were some, but yeah, generally people were pretty good. I have to say, I desperately wanted to provoke a reaction in people but unfortunately I didn't get one very often um, I, I wasn't trying to provoke a violent reaction from anybody god knows I wasn't a violent sort of a person at all and the my particular personal presentation at that style was fairly uh, soft and effeminate I used to wear a lot of bracelets and um, yes I had bright red hair there for a while which I used to tease up into a lovely big kind of 80s quasi mohawk that would fall in front of my eyes and I couldn't see for a day or two I remember the first time I ever did that it's peering through a veil of hair um, but you know and I'd walk around with a big candy striped umbrella and some lovely stripy trousers and pointy shoes to go shopping and but and nobody yeah I mean like I said there was usually people that did abuse me verbally abuse me did so from cars so they were driving by really quickly and they didn't have to um, stop and actually deal with it, but they'd yell faggot and poofter and you know, etc. etc. Mm. Um, a number of people used to question my gender, which I always thought was strange because I was clearly a boy and not a girl. Um, but yeah, little old ladies used to say, Are you a boy, dear, or are you a girl? So that was an they, but you know, that wasn't aggressive at all or unfriendly. Mm. Um, yeah, at night time, I would never have gone out into the city dressed like that. But I felt quite safe going to the valley where the, all the clubs and things were, mm -hmm. and visiting my friends. And you know, I did used to go out in the daytime, but that was when everybody was at work because I was unemployed because I was unemployable. Um, and 
Uh, yeah, so I travel on the buses and uh, travel on the trains, the public transport, without any, without disturbing the commuters or scaring the horses. So, yeah. Okay, so these these are photographs of me that was taken at around my twenty second birthday. So that was nineteen eighty six, and um, yes, you know I have lovely fluffy blonde hair and a beautiful makeup job, uh, courtesy of one of my friends. And um, my lovely harlequin tights, which were, uh, yes, very becoming. <laughs> and a lovely little lace midriff top, because it was the days of Madonna, um, and which somebody had given me for my 21st birthday, so I was wheeling it out for my 20th second birthday. And a little bolero jacket, so um, which I'd borrowed from one of the, my girlfriends. And we all went out to a restaurant, and um, the restaurant thought we were great fun. So we were a lot of people, and yeah, we had a we had a terrific party that night. So these are some of the few photographs of me from that time. So can you tell me about your life on the campus of the University of Queensland when you were attending? Uh, what was the atmosphere like there? Was it fairly open-minded towards gay people? Yes, yes, I thought I found it so. I um, attended there for about eighteen months. Didn't. Uh, complete any degrees I think I started about three different degrees in that time and um, so for the first six months that I was there uh, well for the first eight months I was there I wasn't kind of like I was exploring the the gay life but I wasn't I wasn't out as it were so then uh, eight months after I got there it was my birthday I dyed my hair red did all of that as as I told you Um, and uh, I kind of did it as a way of getting some kind of reaction from people, but really it was a bit disappointing because nobody really reacted at all. It was very accepting. Every, there was a great deal of acceptance. There was, of course, you know, rugby boys and, you know, blokey blokes who um, were fairly uh, abusive. But, um, yeah, no, generally... The university campus was really very accepting. Yeah, um, we had this sort of myth amongst us that it was a really safe place to be, um, and the reason that it was a safe place to be was that it was federal territory in the state of Queensland, and consequently the Queensland police had no powers there. So a lot of people used to come onto the campus and smoke pot, and so they could smoke their pot, and then they would go off, go out for the night. Um, yeah, so like as a gay person, it was a great place to kind of retreat to because it's like, no, 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 you have no power here. <laughs> Don't cross the borders of my land, um, you evil police. So yeah, it was it was it was a great place. It was because there was lots of parties around, and as I said, nobody really cared that um, everybody was pretty indifferent to your sexual orientation. And I remember even going to some of the some parties where these these boys that I thought were just so handsome were hanging out and because they were so friendly they invited me along and I put the word on a couple of them and they all just went oh no (laughs) you know I'm not like that and um and they were very yeah it was very they were very relaxed about it it was yes it was very it was really refreshing having come from somewhere like Rockhampton where everybody just wanted to beat your head in what was it like going to a gay bar in Brisbane in the 80s? <laughs> what was it like? Um, it was always uh, very dark, um, always a bit of a light show. A bit kind of... Um, the, the nightclub that I remember most was called The Terminus and it was downstairs. And even though you went downstairs, that was because the buildings were on a kind of a bit of a slope. So out the back was just kind of like this dirt car park. So you, it was almost like you went to this underground little area, but it always had the feeling of like being under somebody's house. <laughs> so and, uh, this was in the valley, was it? Yes, yes, in the valley. Yeah. So there was the terminus, and then up the road, um, around the corner was one whose name I can't remember, um, and that was a particularly seedy little one. That was very small, again very dark disco ball. And how did the police treat these bars? D- did you uh, did, did they keep a watch on them? Um, they never came in. Oh well, actually, no, that's not true. They did come in from time to time. 
it was rare for them to actually come inside, but they did hang around. Like, there was a heavy police presence on the streets anyway, and in the valley, um, I discovered many years later, but didn't know at the time, that there was casinos just up the road, but they were all upstairs. (laughs) All the gay bars were downstairs, all the casinos were upstairs. So um, there was a heavy police presence on the streets, and sometimes they would... Um, because then there was another bar on the same street but it was at the other end of um, I don't think there was a mall in in Brunswick Street in those days so it was a, it was a couple of blocks up Brunswick Street and the police would um, they'd you know they'd they'd sometimes they'd stop people and ask them for ID and um, those kinds of things. Did they used to hang out at the front of these bars and, and watch people going in? Yes, they did, yes. So there was the one up the road that I was telling you about, which was uh, in the Hacienda Hotel. I can't remember what the actual bar was called. But the police would literally stand at the bottom of the steps so that you would have to walk through them to get to get in. So it was an act of outrageous intimidation. But as long as you didn't have drugs on you or, um, you know, you didn't try to heavy them or push them out of the way or something um, and cop their abuse because they would be verbally abusive um, then you know, you know you could go in but they generally didn't come inside I do remember them coming in from time like once or twice but it wasn't yeah what did they do when they came inside oh I don't know um, you know they'd talk to them talk to the manager and they'd you know strut around a bit and then they'd go mm. so <laughs> yes. Was there a general fear amongst gay men at the time in Brisbane of uh, fear of the police? Fear of the police? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say if there was a general feeling of fear of the police. I certainly didn't ever see the police as my friends or as anybody who would protect me if I was in danger. Um, if, I was, if somebody was to assault me, the last people I'd tell about it would be the police. Um, certainly... Yeah, that didn't yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, the people who did assault me were the, were the police. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But anyway, I certainly didn't feel that I could ever go to them if I was in trouble for something. Mm-hmm. What was when was your first uh, encounter, personal encounter with the police, and what happened? Well, I was um, still a university student then, and I'd gone into the city for reasons I can't recall, and I was catching the train back to somewhere at Roma Street and Roma Street station in those days was a small low building with some big trees and uh, it was very kind of open air and I had walked up to the ticket window I had actually paid for my ticket and then I uh, had this tap on my shoulder and I thought it was somebody waiting behind me to buy a ticket and I turned around and it was a uniformed police officer who said come with me how were you dressed um, I was wearing some stripy trousers with flares, probably some pointy shoes, and uh, maybe a shirt not dissimilar to this one. Um, yeah, I probably had... Uh, I would have had a long fringe. Maybe I had black hair. I think I had black hair at that stage. Um, so I had just, you know, some bad 80s uh, asymmetric bob hairdo happening. Um thought I looked the business but um, yeah but I certainly you know I didn't have any guns or knives or you know appear to be uh, aggressive or dangerous in any way I was I remember being quite polite to the ticket person asking for a ticket please what happened then um, well I went with the police officer because I didn't really have any reason not to um, and had no reason like I thought something bad had happened, you know, some maybe, you know, I'd potentially seen something they were asking me about. So anyway, they took me all the way back to what I was later to discover was the watch house, where I was put into an interrogation room and slapped around. Um, Yeah. What exactly happened? Well, yes, they took me into this interrogation room and asked me some questions about, you know, what was I doing and where was I going, where did I live and who did I live with and um, what did I think I was doing dressed up like, you know, I was, you know, was I a clown, was I a circus performer, you know, what was the thing and, yeah, and I can't, I I must have made some smart response to like, what 
what do you what do you mean and uh yeah and then they just started slapping me around so eventually that stopped how bad did the physical violence get Oh, well, uh, you know, I didn't have bruises all over my body or anything, but I certainly would have had a big fat hand mark on my face. And, um, yeah, I got a few... I did have a couple of bruises sort of, you know, on my shoulders. I'm a delicate... I was a delicate, skinny little thing then. Um, and they were they were big, fat men. They were big, strong men. Um, yeah, and I was... Yeah, I was really kind of quite... Uh, yeah, quite terrified because I'd never been in that situation before. They eventually let me go with words like, you know, just watch yourself or something like that. But they didn't then offer to take me to where I was going. My ticket was, my train ticket was no longer any good. I didn't have any more money. I think I had to walk back to the university from town, which was a long way. And uh, yeah, and I was just left quite dazed and confused about what it all was. Um, and it certainly is. It, yeah, every time I remember that, every time I saw a police car from then on, when I for the period that I lived in Brisbane until 1984, my heart would start to race. Like, my goodness, what's going to happen now? So that was my first. That was my introduction to the Queensland Police Force. So that was your first encounter with the Queensland Police. What happened then? Well, I moved to a household in Spring Hill, and uh, they. Uh, it was one of those households that had been ongoing, so there'd been a bunch of people living there and then they'd moved out, but one of them had stayed and somebody had moved in and so on and so forth. So um, the police actually came looking for somebody who lived there previously, but as soon as they opened the door, as soon as the door was opened, um, they, well, they said, oh, we're here to see blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as uh, the door was opened to them, they said, under the powers of some drug act some act that was related to search and seizure ostensibly for drug for the control of drugs and prohibited substances they could come into your house without a search warrant and detain you for up to 48 hours and there was all these kind of you know it was a joe era thing because joe was on the throne then and um yeah and they basically took the house apart upside down marched us all up and down the back stairs um, and were very verbally abusive to us the whole time it being a household of gay men mostly um, and so then they went away after that and then they just kept coming back and doing the same thing um, but searching for drugs well ostensibly searching the house and just you know they'd take every I don't know if they just did it you know they were bored at the the station and they'd think oh let's go and do this because that's what it felt like because they'd turn up at you know two o'clock on a Tuesday morning um you know seven o'clock on a Sunday morning um you know nine o'clock on a Friday night uh and were you verbally harassed by them at, at, during these visits oh yes yes they're verbally harassed and they would sometimes that was an old Queenslander on stilt so sometimes they would actually they wouldn't come to the front door they would actually walk under the house and come up the back stairs and through the back door, not knock or just walk in, just walk straight into the house. So, uh, and say so you you fucking faggot or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, stay where you are, you fucking poofta and you know, your homos and da, 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 filth and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it got a yeah, it just got a bit much. I left, I moved out of that house, and I moved up to a very nice apartment on Gregory Terrace in Spring Hill and from there I actually then left the state it was 1984 by then and uh, yeah I just decided I'd had enough you had an encounter while you were driving a car you told me oh yes (laughs) I had taken I didn't have a license didn't have a driver's license but regardless a friend of mine had given me his car to use that night um, and I'd gone to a club so I'd driven my friend home all the way to Balimba and I was drunk so as I was driving home I was disoriented I ended up in the city and um, I was pulled over by the police because I was the only car on the road at the time so and it was 5 30 in the morning or something and they when they pulled me over and they breathalyzed me I was actually dressed in my nightclub gear so I had on a pair of brown ballet tights and this kind of 
outfit that I had made myself by taking two beautiful um, kind of 70s Bedouin curtains and tying them, punching holes in them and tying them together with a big sleeve on one side. So it hung attractively off one shoulder and it came down to my knees and was sort of cinched in at the waist (laughs) by some lovely plaited thing with bells on it. Um, And so they took me to the watch house and um, strip searched me and gave me back my tights and then that's what I had to appear in court in in the next day. So, um, yeah. So you were held at the watch house in your costume Mm. and then you uh, were were led to court as you were dressed. Exactly so. And I made a comment. (laughs) I remember going down in the lift with a few police people one of whom was a police officer and she made some comment about my outfit and I said well you're the one in trousers you tell me <laughs> so she, she made some comment about it's not an appropriate outfit for a boy so anyway mm. Mm. but anyway I did what did the court decide oh well that I was a filthy little drink driver and um, but I didn't have a license so they couldn't actually cancel my license or anything so they prohibited me from holding a license for I think 12 months and I think they gave me a fine but I don't I actually don't remember they must have given me a fine I hope they gave me a fine um, <laughs> the me now would smack that Peter's bottom very hard but uh, yeah I think they find me but that was that was all it was apart from the trauma of you know having to walk the streets of Brisbane in the daytime in my nightwear so that was yeah that was okay Mm. I survived so you left Queensland for a few years um where did you go um I came to live in Sydney then and I lived here for a couple of years um in one of those years I was actually verbally assaulted on the street Um, when I was outside a place where I was working and these three teenagers who were on speed came and, um, yes, called me a faggot and a poofter and wanted to, basically they were trying to provoke a fight with me and I just walked then into my workplace and they were chased off by my co-workers and that was, you know, I was a bit shaken by it but I was otherwise, I didn't think any more of it. Um, And in 1987 I went back to live in Queensland and at that time court proceedings about that event and some other event that those boys had caused on the same day was in the process of the court and I had to go back to the watch house where I'd actually been assaulted to um, give a statement to the police about this event. In New South Wales? So the event had happened in New South Wales but I was I'd returned to live in Queensland and uh, yes it seemed to be strange to be giving a, an account of an assault you know, to these police officers who were very polite I have to say they were they were quite polite at times it, things had moved on a bit since mm. since then and you were telling me after you had returned to Queensland the police used to watch your house where were you living and what were the, what were the circumstances yes. well after that particular having to go in and report it I then moved back into the city and I was living in a household with a, a woman and a um, a fellow gay man and he came home with he used to go out quite a lot and he came home one night with the police in that he came home in the company of the police and uh, they came through the house it was four of them and they came through the house and uh, you know did the whole search and and uh, abuse thing and then uh, went away and that seemed to alert them to something about our household though I was much more um I wasn't nearly so flamboyant in those days. I was, I was still, um, I was sort of young and pretty, but I didn't. Yeah, I wasn't dressed quite as radically as I used to. I just sort of think I was quite conservative, actually. But anyway, the police would sit outside of our house and um, follow us up the street uh, in their car at a walking pace to the corner where we would go to the shops. And sometimes they would just do that. Sometimes they would drive a little bit quicker and say that they would stop us and talk to us out the window. Um, Sometimes they would actually get out of the car and, you know, ask for ID and ask us a range of questions. Ask us, ask me. They only ever did it to one person at a time. Um, So I was always alone. I was never in company when they did this. Um, Yeah. And then 
if they would they would leave us alone or leave me alone get back into their car go to the shop and by the time I get back to my house they would be outside the gate again and so at night time uh, when they were doing that you'd walk out and suddenly these car lights would go on and these headlights would follow you up the street so yes that how long did the police wait for you outside your house and, and what suburb of Brisbane was it this was in New Farm in Heel Street uh, actually and how long for um, they would if you they weren't there every day but and the, it was probably for a couple of months, over a period of a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, I was leaving. I had planned to leave at the end of the year anyway because I'd finished my course. Then I'd gone to Brisbane to study. And, um, yeah, so they seemed to, you know, they got bored with that game after a while. But it was certainly very intimidating and, you know, perfectly unnecessary. We weren't doing anything. They could have seen into our w- bedroom windows from the street they could have walked up the side of the house and looked in the windows in the side of the house and seen all the other rooms in the house. They could perfectly well have observed us doing whatever they thought we were doing. So what was the purpose of this, standing outside or sitting in their car outside your house? I have no idea, Barry. Uh, to intimidate us. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why we was. I don't know why they chose to do it to us or if we were... Um, I mean, the, what was special about us? They didn't find. They never found any drugs in all of these drug raids, all of these endless harassments. The um, yeah, they just yeah, they just used that as an excuse um, to yeah to harass us and verbally abuse us and you know call us all sorts of unpleasant names and tell us all you know very unpleasant things. So, and, you know, threaten us with, well, we could do this and we could do that and, you know, it all, it all just, it was just bully boy things, really. It was quite, quite surprising as a young adult to uh, find these people in positions of authority who were just exercising it for the sake of it. Do you know of any other gay men who were similarly harassed like you? Um, not personally. I mean, my friends all have stories about, you know, their encounters with the police in various at various times um yeah doing things at various levels of legality um but yeah certainly being harassed by the police wasn't an uncommon thing you know they they would just stop you and question you and you know poke you and make poke you where oh you know you listen here sonny that kind of thing um and they, they all seem to be older than me at that time. Now they're all so much younger than me, but <laughs> all the police always seem to be older in those days. Um, so you describe yourself as a political refugee from Queensland who came to New South Wales. Why, why do you say that? I was basically drummed out of the state. Um, you know, I was just harassed by the police constantly. I was just sick of being pointlessly stopped, you know, I could, I would have known some of them by their first names by the end of it. I'd seen them that often, and they had seen me. And never, in all the times that they'd stopped me, searched me, questioned me, had anything ever kind of moved on from it, other than those times when that time that I told you about when they took me to the watch house. Um, I just couldn't understand what it was about, but I did know that it made me feel very. Um, It worked. I felt very enclosed. I felt very controlled and, you know, it made me anxious to go out, to go out the door um, of the house. And it's like, well, that's not a very healthy way to live. So I'd been to, I'd been to visit Sydney and I, you know, I'd been able to skip around the streets dressed like a fairy with nobody batting an eye. And I thought, oh, well, this might be the place for me. And in 1984, homosexuality was decriminalised in New South Wales. So that meant that there was no overhanging worries. And I got an offer, so I took it. What was it like when you first came to Sydney? What, did you feel a, a great sense of freedom? Or? Um, I had a very nice time. I was actually living with some very unpleasant people um, in King's Cross 
And so I had to, and I got a job where I was a shift worker, and so I had to schlep across King's Cross at like three o'clock on a Sunday morning, which is not a pretty sight. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wasn't. When I got here, I felt very. Fr- I did have a sense of freedom, and I had, a, you know, went to the beach, and it was summer, and it was sunny, and it was, you know, beautiful city, and the water's everywhere, and there's all these handsome men everywhere. And, um, yeah, like, I remember even our postman was gay. So <laughs> it just seemed to be like, oh, there were gay people everywhere. So, um, yeah, it was it was uh, yeah, difficult to say that I had, a, you know, a sense of freedom. But I certainly didn't have that feeling, that sense of being enclosed. I felt like I could just go for a walk in the street and not have to worry that, you know, am I going to get home for dinner you know are the police going to stop me and for I remember I actually remember for about six months like seeing a police car and thinking oh my you know I haven't got my heart didn't speed up because <laughs> I still had that I still had that response every time I saw a police car but about the first six months that I lived in Sydney of you know getting really anxious and thinking oh my god what's going to happen now how did the gay scene of sydney in the 1980s compare to brisbane's gay scene at that time oh it was so exciting (laughs) i mean it was all centered on oxford street everything that was happening was happening on oxford street and yeah you know there was clubs across the road from each other and um yeah and everybody i knew who was that's where they were and um yeah it was fun i didn't actually um I have to say I didn't spend very long in it. It was like, oh wow, isn't that dazzling? And then I retreated to the beach where I was living. But that was, yeah, that was more my scene. Mm. Don't mess around.